So Andrew Danyi is the co-founder and co-editor of Mattering Press, and he's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Sociology at the Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main. And prior to this, Ender was a doctoral researcher at the Department of Sociology at Lancaster University. Inspired by science and technology studies, his PhD thesis was a material semiotic analysis of liberal democracy through the Hungarian parliament building. Ender's current research focuses on three themes, the role of numbers in democratic politics, the ways in which bodies become political, and the politics of knowledge making practices in science and technology studies. And you can find out more about Mattering Press at matteringpress.org. I'm just going to put your presentation up. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, so thanks so much, uh, Gary and Janneke, for organizing this and uh, inviting me. Um, it's a great privilege to be here, and I'm very much excited about the discussions today and the subsequent seminars. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today, I think, will resonate very, in very interesting ways with both Sarah's talk and also with Gary and Janneke's paper about um, the artist books. Um, I think it's, there are very interesting parallels there. Um, but let me start with Mattering Press. So the term Mattering, ah, and I need to click. Uh, the term mattering uh, comes from science and technology studies. Um, probably many of you know that this is a heterogeneous field that brings together sociologists, social anthropologists, human geographers, cultural economists, and many others with the aim of uh, problematizing science's self-understanding as a set of disembedded and disembodied practices. They usually do this problematization by making the actual places and the actual practices uh, of knowledge making more visible. The field itself was established in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when the first ethnographic studies of some Western European and North American laboratories were published. And since then, STS scholars have extended their gaze uh, to various other sites, from hospitals, through high-tech innovation centers, uh, to stock exchange trading rooms, in order to explore how scientific knowledge is being produced and distributed through seemingly trivial material practices and how it could be produced and distributed differently. Ironically, what's largely missing from the list of usual STS sites um, are the institutions that play one of the most important roles in shaping the academic world STS scholars themselves operate in, namely publishers. So to address this hiatus, Mattering Press was established in 2012 by a, a small group of young scholars uh, to better understand current developments in academic publishing by actively participating in them. Um, as I said in the beginning, we are an open access publisher. We publish um, peer-reviewed books, or we will publish peer-reviewed books, um, empirically grounded monographs and uh, edited collections of various formats. Hopefully, the first uh, publications will come out in the end of this year. Uh, this is a small group of people, and everyone, although we all come from STS, everyone has his or her own interest in this project. Uh, mine is politics. So what I'm going to talk about today is what I call the politics of self-publishing. Uh, in this short presentation, I will articulate what this might mean using the illegal or sumis.publishing uh, in in the 1970s and 1980s in communist Hungary. First, I will briefly recount the history of Samizdat production uh, in Central and Eastern Europe in general and Hungary in particular. And then drawing on the insights of Samizdat research, I will identify three dimensions of self-publishing, materiality, experimentation, and the ethics of openness. Uh, and finally, referring to a couple of STS scholars, I will discuss how these di three dimensions might be simultaneously captured by the term mattering and how they might be re reflected in our own publishing practices. So this is what I have to offer today. Um, and so first I will start with Samizdat histories. The term Samizdat was coined by, by the Russian poet Nikolai Glaskov in the uh, early 1950s, and it means self-publishing. It refers to both to the various processes of pro pro producing texts unauthorized by the state and to the outcomes of those processes, 
mostly literary and political writings that could not have appeared in official periodicals. In the Soviet Union, until the mid-1950s, some of the activities were limited to circulating handwritten manuscripts or a few copies of uncensored typescripts among friends and colleagues. It was only a few years after Stalin's death when a wider group of people began to reproduce and pass on uncensored writings, sometimes even without the author's consent. From the late 1950s onwards, some illegally published uh, journal, uh, journals and books, such as less-known works of Bulgakov, Pasternak, and Solzhenitsyn, could re reach much wider readership, often by getting Western publishing houses involved in the production process. So what you see here is um, the original typescript of uh, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, and um, pay particular attention to the, to the materiality of this object. The relative success of literary samizdat in the Soviet Union was followed by the gradual appearance of more explicit political writings, such as open letters, appeals, even manifestos. Perhaps the most important periodical of this kind was the Chronicle of Current Events, which regularly contained reports on violations of human rights. So here's a, a, a typescript of, uh, of an issue of the Chronicle. According to estimates, the circulation of the Chronicle was between 1,000 and 10,000, with the readership between 10,000 and 100,000. As the number of copies of illegally published texts kept increasing, those who were writing, distributing, or even reading some is that, risked constant, constant harassment by the secret police. In order to pre uh, prevent imprisonment and confiscation of manuscripts and printing technologies, dissidents form various networks in which sensitive information, printed texts, money, and other objects could be transmitted in an anonymous manner. Outside the Soviet Union, some is that activities in one form or another existed in many Central and Eastern European countries. The history of Hungarian some is that began in the late 1960s, although some illegally published poems and novels had been around since the, the early 1950s. Initially, this was much more of an artistic ambition rather than an explicitly political mission. One of the most exciting places where avant-garde artists, political philosophers, and other groups labeled as deviant by com communist authorities could gather to experiment with new forms of expression was a chapel at Balaton Boglan. Balaton is a lake not very far from, from Budapest. Each summer between 1970 and 1974, dozens of people moved into the chapel and the surrounding field for a few weeks to present their art or theoretical work. These summer events were more than simply occasions to meet like-minded people. As one of the action artists put it, um, these performances were punishment preventive orthotherapies. So here you can see uh, a performance artist uh, engaging in a punishment preventive orthotherapy. The lectures presented and artworks exhibited at the chapel often conveyed serious political messages, which consequently led to the official closure of the chapel in 1974 uh, uh, and to the forced immigration or arrest of many of the artists. After Bolaton Boglar, it proved to, proved to be difficult to keep different strands of alternative artists and political troublemakers together. It was only in the 1980s, uh, early, early 1980s, that a number of illegal publishing houses could be established in Hungary. Some publishers commissioned essays on taboo topics, such as the 1956 revolution or the everyday struggles of Hungarian minorities in neighboring countries. So these are some, some of the uh, covers of um, illegally published text. The bottom left is a book about the 1956 revolution. Uh, the top left, the title is uh, The Aesthetics of Censorship. Um, yeah, other publishers um, debuted with works of banned authors such as Arthur Köstler or George Orwell. As a result of gradual in institutionalization of Samizdat production, in 1981, the first issue of the most influential Samizdat uh, periodical, the quarterly Besselö, appeared in about 1,000 copies, followed by a circulation of 2,000 for subsequent issues. The aim of the founder editors of these publishing houses and periodicals was, in their own words, to create a parallel or a second society where any political topic could be discussed openly. 
So okay, this was this was my my kind of brief history of Samizdat um, in Central Europe and in Hungary, and now I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the three dimensions of self-publishing, uh, starting with materiality. So according to the dominant view in Samizdat research, the aim of illegally published texts was to report the real conditions in communist societies to transmit the truth suppressed in the official world of state-censored publications. Probably this view explains why most researchers concentrate ex exclusively on the content of Samizdat texts. However, the content and the material existence of Samizdat texts can hardly be analyzed independent of each other. To quote the literary scholar N. Komaromi, the amateur typescript, the deformity of the text, the characteristic mistakes, corrections, fragile paper, and the degraded print quality had value because they marked the difference between Samizdat and official publications. Moreover, building upon Jacques Derrida's concept of the written trace, Komaromi argues that there was an element of ambiguity in the relationship between the physical form and the idealized content. Unlike officially published texts, Samizdat articles were constantly modified by copists, by authors, had practically no control over the life of their own writings. In many cases, the message central to mainstream, mainstream Samizdat research existed in so many versions that it became of secondary importance compared to the symbolic value of the text object itself. <clears throat> Seen this way, Samizdat in the Eastern Bloc can be considered as a distinctive text object the result of a complicated process that required the cooperation of a whole range of actors, including authors, typewriters, editors, graphic designers, low-tech or occasionally high-tech printing devices, distributors with vans, and so on. It was also the beginning of subsequent processes in which periodicals and books got borrowed, secretly photocopied, collected, read and discussed, and no doubt analyzed by the authorities. Such processes in some is that research are usually discussed as particular forms of resistance associated with the subordinate or the powerless. In an essay entitled The Terrifying Mimicry of Samizdat, another literary scholar, Sergei Ushakin, criticizes this understanding of resistance located in places outside of the fields of power. Through the analysis of illegal publishing in the Soviet Union between the late 1960s and the late 1970s, Ushakin argues that the topics and the ways in which dissidents discussed them were largely framed by existing public discourses on Soviet law and civic and human rights. In other words, he claims that those involved in Samizdat publishing mimicked and thus ex act actively experimented with dominant political order. So here's a quote from him. Dissidents question not so much the principles of the existing political order, but rather than implementation. For the majority, the issue was not whether socialism was feasible at all. It was too real to have any doubts about its, its existence. Instead, to quote the title of an influential Samizdat article, the main question was, is a non-totalitarian type of socialism possible? Historically speaking, the answer seems to be no. Um, in 1989-1990, the state socialist regimes in Central and Eastern Europe gradually fell apart. The democratic transition made not only the institution of state censorship obsolete, but also the established practices of illegal publishing. In fact, the only places where some is that can be found these days are temporary exhibitions and specialized archives, for example, the collection of the Open Society archives in Budapest. Located in these institutions, the once illegally published texts serve as obligatory passage points for historians interested in the collapse of communism, but are considered to have no relevance whatsoever to contemporary politics. But is this right? Recent uses of Samizdat as a term suggest otherwise. According to the jargon file, which is a comprehensive compendium of hacker slang, Samizdat originally referred to underground duplication and distribution of banned books in the Soviet Union, now refers by obvious extension to any less than official promulgation of textual material, especially rare, obsolete, or never formally published computer documentation. Some is that is obviously much easier when one has access to high bandwidth networks and high quality laser printers." End of quote. 
So given this um, kind of afterlife uh, of, of Samizdat, it's not surprising that there's a collaborative tool uh, called Samizdat that can be used to publish websites. So this is, um, this is an, an application called Samizdat. Samizdat is a generic RDF-based engine for building collaboration and open publishing websites. Samizdat provides users with means to cooperate and coordinate on all kinds of activities, including media activism, resource sharing, education and research, advocacy, and so on. Samizdat intends to promote values of freedom, openness, equality, and cooperation. Samizdat's open and transparent nature and its multilingual cap capabilities make it an excellent solution for international and political projects." End of quote. And finally, you will be very happy to hear that there are a number of open access book publishers that use the term, like Samis.press and Samis.express. <laughs> um, so there are more examples, um, and they are obviously different from each other, but what seems to connect them is a specific ethics of op openness. So these were the three dimensions I wanted to highlight, and now I will say a few words about mattering. Um, because I think the term mattering um, very nicely captures, in a way, all three dimensions, but not without adding a certain twist uh, to them. So let me briefly go through them again and qualify them with three quotes from science and technology studies. So the first meaning of mattering is, is associated with materiality. <clears throat> As we've seen the, in the case of some is that publishing, the materiality of the texts had played an important role in establishing the truth value of those texts. In our case, uh, this is clearly not the situation. In fact, our aim is to produce as beautiful and professional looking texts as possible. So mattering for us is to make visible how such texts come about. And um, to use Susan Lee Starr's words, mattering in this sense is to uh, take on the erasing process um, as the central human behavior of concern, and then to track that comparatively across domains. This is, in the end, a profoundly political process, since so many forms of social control rely on the erasure or silencing of various workers, on deleting their work from represent the representations of work. So in very practical terms, um, we place a great emphasis on uh, when we produce books um, to indicate or make visible all the work that goes into the making of it. Authors are important, editors are important, but so are proofreaders and designers and a whole bunch of other people. So I think this is an important thing that is not just a gesture, but also a political intervention. The second meaning of mattering has to do with experimentation. In the case of Samizdat publishing, this term was used to place those involved in illegal publishing not in direct opposition to a singular regime, but to put them in a position from where experimentation with various aspects of that regime became possible. So just as the aim of some is that publishing was not to bring down state socialism, mattering is not um, against current forms of commercial or academic publishing as such. It proposes not so much a new definition of truth as a method of experimentation or a construction for new truth. To experiment is to consider theory as a creative practice. This is why it is no longer a question of knowing what is true, but how truth comes about. So this is a quote uh, by William James, uh, quoted by Isabel Stengers in her book on Whitehead. <laughs> Sorry, this is just um, having fun. Um, again, in practical terms, we are all for experimentation, um, but we don't think that this is a, this is a general uh, scheme. In fact, I think it's very important to figure out what an experiment is or what it's, what it's all, all about in a series of dialogues with, with authors. So uh, what, what, what is experimental for them and why is it important um, to do it this way and not, not in others? And finally, <clears throat> the third meeting, me meaning of mattering has an ethical component. In the case of Samizdat publishing, this ethics was and still is defined primarily in terms of openness. However, making things open is only half of the story. 
The other half of is to keep things open, which requires what Anne-Marie Moll, uh, Anne uh, a Dutch philosopher, calls care. So mattering, in this sense, is a process. It does not have clear boundaries. It is open-ended. This is not a matter of size. It does not mean that a care process is larger, more encompassing than the devices and activities that are part of it. Instead, it is a matter of time. For care is not a small or large product that changes hands, but a matter of various hands working together over time towards a result. Care is not a transaction in which something is ex ex exchanged, a product against a price, but an interaction in which the action goes back and forth in an ongoing process. So this is the end of the quote. Again, in, in practical terms, um, in Mattering Press, we are very much interested in getting readers and uh, um, uh, a smaller collective of, of academics involved already in the, ma in the making of the book. Uh, uh, and also we are experimenting with uh, open reviews. So peer review, but the reviewers uh, are in an ongoing conversation with the authors. Again, I'm, I'm happy to tell you more about this maybe in the discussion. I think I will end here. Thanks a lot.